Good morning, Faith Bridge. We're the Gwazdan family. Good morning. We miss you. Glad you're joining us this morning. Um, we're looking forward to when we can finally meet again as a family. And uh, when we do, we're going to save you a seat in front of us because we're the back row sitters.
goodness. We praise you for your love. We praise you for your grace. God, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your words this morning from Pastor Jeff. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray this. Amen. Thank you, worship team. What a beautiful day to worship together. I think that it's safe to say that spring is finally springing. Uh, However, I don't think I'm going to pack my snow clothes away just yet. I've come to realize that the weather here in Minnesota is pretty bipolar, uh, or maybe better described as having multiple personality disorder, uh, because I've discovered within the last couple of weeks that you can get all four seasons in the span of 20 minutes. Now, whatever the weather decides to do outside, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be digging into the second half of the Beatitudes. Now, if you recall from last week, the Beatitudes form a code of conduct policy, or the house rules, if you will, for those who are members of the kingdom of heaven. Now, maybe you're wondering, what does it mean to be a member of the kingdom of heaven? Well, let me describe it for you. A person becomes a member of the kingdom of heaven by choosing to place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. When you place your faith in Jesus, you are trusting His work on the cross, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you are trusting in the power of his resurrection to give you hope for eternal life and an entirely new identity. Before placing our faith in Jesus, you and I were counted as enemies of God, rebellious, stubborn, and bent on destruction. After placing our faith in Christ, however, we are now the adopted sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. And as the adopted sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ, we have become part of God's family. And like for so many other families, there are some house rules that are expected of God's kids. And the Beatitudes are those house rules. We live by these house rules not to earn God's favor and love, but because of His great love for us and our responsive love for Him. The Beatitudes are the essential character traits for those who are the sons and daughters of God through Christ. And Jesus, as our older brother, the author and perfecter of our faith, he's shown us through his life on earth what living according to the house rules looks like. It's understood in family systems that often the oldest sibling carries the most responsibility. They're the first, and and they feel the weight of doing it right, quote-unquote and living up to mom and dad's expectations. The oldest sibling often paves the way for their brothers and her sisters that come after them. And often the younger siblings look up to their older sibling, whether they acknowledge it or not, to see how they got things right or how they didn't get things right, so as to avoid those same mistakes and some painful consequences. Now in Jesus, we have an older sibling who has perfectly lived and modeled for us how to live according to the house rules of the kingdom of heaven. And God the Father has honored Jesus' obedience to doing His will. Jesus has promised to give us life, and life abundantly. Now that abundant life comes when we trust in His guidance and provision through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to live our lives according to the house rules. Now in understanding those house rules, we, we set a foundation of how to live and conduct ourselves as members of the kingdom of heaven. But there's a challenge for us when we abide by those rules, because we live in a world that does not follow that same set of rules. The rules that the world follows are driven by sin and self, which leads to all manner of evil and destruction. This immediately puts those who live according to the rules of the kingdom of heaven directly at odds with those who are living according to the kingdom of this world. And this is something that Jesus addresses directly in the Beatitudes. Now, the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount that follows the Beatitudes then addresses how living according to the house rules impacts every area of our lives, from our relationship with our spouses, our relationship with others in general, our reputation, our inner thoughts and feelings, how we deal with money and material possessions, how we interact with God. Now, last week, we went over the first half of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. These seem to really address the foundation of our relationship with God. We learned from the first half of those house rules that we are to recognize our spiritual depravity and bankruptcy because of our sin. Now, this conviction then leads to sorrowful repentance and forgiveness. Once we've experienced forgiveness and with our spiritual life restored and our relationship with God properly established, 
we can now think rightly and humbly uh, think of ourselves not as being better than we really are, and certainly not any better than anyone else. We have a proper estimation of who we are. And with that proper understanding and proper relationship between us and God through Jesus Christ, Our desire to grow in our righteousness should increase, as does our ability to live in right relationship with God each and every day, knowing that only in our relationship with Jesus will the longing of our souls be truly satisfied, more satisfied than even food or drink can provide for those who only satisfy, for those only satisfy our hunger and not our spiritual hunger. If you haven't already turned there, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Now that we've reviewed last week's message, today we're going to look at the second half of the Beatitudes. As I mentioned earlier, we're the first four related to our relationship with God. And these next four, we're going to see how we are to live in relationship with other human beings and our responsibility to them. Let's pick up where we left off and read Matthew chapter 5, verses 7 through 12 together. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven." For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's start with verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, mercy has a dual function, as it embraces both forgiveness for the guilty and compassion for the suffering and needy. Now, Jesus doesn't give a specific instance of being merciful because mercy is to be a function of Jesus' disciples generally and not just of a particular circumstance that would warrant it. But what does it mean to be merciful or, or to show mercy? A word that is synonymous to mercy in English and, and that might help us to get a better understanding of mercy is sympathy. Sympathy is a compound word. And it's constructed from two Greek words, sim, meaning together, and pathos, referring to feelings or emotion. And it's used to describe when one person shares the same feelings of another, such as when someone close is experiencing grief or loss. So to have sim pathos means that we experience things together with the other person, literally going through what he or she is going through. It's not a contrived sense of pity or feeling sorry for someone else, but rather it carries the connotation of of getting into someone else's skin or to climb into their experience with them. The unfortunate reality is that this is precisely what so many people do not even try to do. Because generally speaking, we live in a culture that lacks sympathos. Perhaps this is due to our our individualism and and the self-centeredness that's so prevalent in our culture, and and that, that people are so concerned with their own feelings that they're not so much concerned with the feelings of anybody else. Or maybe it's because we're overstimulated by the images that we see on TV or the stories that come across our news feeds that we've almost become numb to the pain and suffering that exists in the world. The result is that when we do feel sorry for someone else, it is, as it were, from the outside. We we don't make this deliberate effort to get inside the other person's mind and heart so that we can see and feel things that she or he sees and feels. Why is that? Well, for me, it's because it takes time, sometimes a lot of time. And admittedly, I'm pretty selfish when it comes to my time, especially when I'm under stress. I can become very focused on my own stuff, and I get this kind of tunnel vision as it relates to the needs of others because I'm so focused on what I'm doing, and I I just don't see what other people are going on, and so I lack sympathy. And if you don't believe me, just ask my wife and kids. But another reason why we don't show mercy or sympathize the way that we are called to as members of the kingdom of heaven is because it takes effort and energy Add to that effort our own dysfunction and our our own emotional, physical, spiritual, and relational trauma, 
and it becomes almost an insurmountable obstacle to look past our own issues to show mercy to others who are struggling. This kind of reminds me of the story of the, the Good Samaritan. In that parable, you have a man who is beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. Two men pass by and ignore him, one of which is a pastor, and the other guy is in seminary, training to go into ministry. Those two guys were so preoccupied with their own things and themselves that they couldn't give the dying man, one of their own kin, the time of day, let alone any kind of genuine mercy. But then along comes the Samaritan, someone who was hated and despised by the man, or at least people from the man's group, who was on the side of the road. If anybody who would have been justified to pass by and leave the man for dead, it was the Samaritan. But he doesn't. He stops and tends the man's wounds and then takes him to an inn to recover. It took the Samaritan's time. It took his energy and effort. It took his resources. But he was willing to look past the massive obstacle of difference in ethnicity and culture, the differences in ideology and religious practice, and show a dying man mercy. What would happen if we followed the house rules that Jesus is teaching us? How would our relationships change if we modeled this kind of sympathos? How would it change you? What would it require of you to step into showing that kind of mercy? I think it would do a few things. Number one, it would save us from being kind in the wrong way. What do I mean by that? We would not be insensitive and mistaken in our kindness. So often when we wish to be kind... The kindness that we show has to be given in our way, and the other person has to put up with it whether he or she likes it or not. And then we get offended when our thoughtfulness is not appreciated. But our, our kindness would be doubly kind and would be saved from much unintentional kindness if we would only make the effort to get inside the other person. I can't think of any greater example than husbands and wives especially with me and my wife, buying presents for her birthday or for Mother's Day or for our anniversary. Why is it that my wife is able to get just the right thing while I seem to struggle or I wait to the last minute? Can any of you husbands relate? My wife is far more merciful than I am, and I have to work hard to get into her heart and her head. But when I do, when I take that time, when I make that effort, her emotional love tank is filled to the top. Another way that this would help us is that it would make forgiveness and it would make tolerance ever so much easier. Too often we forget that there is a cause and a reason for why a person thinks and acts the way that they do. And if we would just take some time to understand that cause or reason, then it would be far easier to show that person mercy through understanding sympathos and forgiveness. It seems, though, that we often filter another's emotions through our own set of experiences. We, we experience and filter others' pain through our own pain. And so if a, a person is upset or grumpy or irritable, often we take that personally as though it's being directed at us, when in fact they're just really hurt and it has nothing to do with us. And we will never know why someone is acting or feeling as they are, as they are until we make the deliberate attempt to get inside the other person's heart and mind. And lastly, is this not what God has modeled for us through the incarnation of Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus quite literally took on flesh and got inside the skin of a man as he incarnated. Jesus came as a man. He was a human being. He was God with skin and flesh on. He came to see things with men's eyes, emoting as a man emotes, only perfectly, and thought things with a man's mind, again, only perfectly and without sin. God is completely aware of how to experience life as a human being because he became one of us. And I think that we often forget that about Jesus. He came to men not as the remote, detached, isolated, majestic God, but as a human being, God in the flesh. And getting back to the parable, the truth is that only those who show this kind of mercy, this kind of sympathos, it is only those that show that that will receive the same mercy back. A great truth in life is that what we see in others is often a reflection of ourselves. And so if we're detached and disinterested in them, then they will respond detached and disinterested in us. But if they see that we care, 
then their hearts will open up and they will respond to us in kind. I encourage you and challenge you to try and experiment this week. As you, as you talk with people, as you interact with them, even, even with your spouse, it's a great place to start, or your kids, look them in the eyes. Lean into them and wait until they're finished speaking until you respond. And when you respond, speak softly and kindly to them, focusing on positive and affirming words that communicate your care and concern for them. And I think you'll be surprised at just how much more open and meaningful your conversations will become as you practice those techniques. See, being merciful is directly tied to the meek and the beatitude that comes a couple before it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In that parable, or in that beatitude, to be meek means to acknowledge to others that we are sinners. To be merciful is to have compassion on others because they are sinners too. So perhaps like we did last week, perhaps a way that we could rephrase this beatitude is by saying, oh, the blessedness of the person who gets right inside other people until he or she can see with their eyes, think with their thoughts, and feel with their feelings. For the person who does that will find others doing the same for them, and they will know that is what God has done in Jesus Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If any of the Beatitudes should arrest our attention and demand us to stop, to think, and to examine ourselves, it's this one. Now, like mercy in the previous beatitude, purity, purity of heart has a dual function. On one level, there's the person's inner moral purity, their motives. And then on the second, there is this this connotation of a single-minded focus, of, of being undivided. So being pure in heart means that you are completely sincere in all that you do and that you are rightly motivated in how you think and act. It also means that you think rightly. Now, what this means is that a member of the kingdom of heaven is single-minded in their commitment to the kingdom and its righteousness, something that Jesus will talk about later in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And that person will also be inwardly pure, meaning their motives are purely driven. Any motivation that is driven by deceit cannot coexist with sincere devotion to Christ. Can you think of the last time when you acted out of absolutely unmixed motives? When you, when you just did something because it was the right thing to do and not because you thought you would get something back, whether it was a word of affirmation or appreciation or, or putting a favor in the bank. I have to admit that this is one of the most difficult house rules to live by because too often, probably more often than I'd care to admit, that my motives are rarely pure. Even if I'm 99% pure, there's still 1% of impurity, right? And the truth is, most of our purity is is more like a 60-40 or a 70-30 ratio of pure to impure motives, or maybe flip that. Now, one of the things that I I really enjoy doing is is paying for other people's orders in the drive-thru. Now, I don't want everybody lining up behind me, because I I may not pay for you, and I don't want you to be disappointed. So I don't do it all the time, but I do it frequently. And I always wonder how that might bless the person behind me in line, because who knows what kind of day they're having. And I truly do it, not for their recognition, but because I want to bless them, to extend some mercy. But don't think my motives are totally pure. Because I enjoy feeling good about myself when I do it. That I was able to bless someone and the self-appreciation, the self-congratulation that comes with it. Good job, Jeff. You're a good guy. You really paid it forward, didn't you? Do you see just how wicked and deceitful that my heart, that your heart can be? In fact, Jeremiah the prophet tells us that the heart is wicked above all things. Who can know it? Well, God knows my heart and God knows your heart. And that is precisely why one of his house rules is for you and I to be pure in our heart, to be pure in our motives. Because if our heart is so wicked and depraved, is it even possible to have pure motives? How do I keep control of motives, my motives in order to keep them pure? I, I think the Apostle Paul has the key to unlock that mystery. It's found in Paul's letter to the Colossians. You don't have to turn there, but uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, he writes this in chapter 3, verse 17. 
And he's talking about in the context of putting on our new identity, who we are in Christ. And in verse 17, he, he, he kind of summarizes his first flow of thought. He says, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Did you catch that? Whatever you do, in word or deed, in our thoughts, in our speech, in our actions, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, it's pretty hard to be selfish when my motive is driven by a desire to worship Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. And so running our motives, our words, our actions through the grid of Jesus and God the Father is a sure way to check our purity and the quality of our devotion. So if my motive to pay for someone's coffee or food in the drive-thru is being done in the name of Jesus, and I can, give God, I can give thanks to God the Father through Jesus for the means and ability to pay for that in order to bless another person and finding my satisfaction in Him, then my motive has been proven to be pure. In Psalm 24, King David asks this penetrating question in verse 3. He, he asks, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in His holy place? David follows up with the answer, he who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The pure in heart will certainly see God. So another way that we can think of uh, this beatitude, the way that we can rephrase it is, is this, Oh, the blessedness of the person whose motives are absolutely pure and unmixed, for that person will someday be able to see God. Let's continue on. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Jesus continues this wonderful progression of the merciful to the pure in heart with blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You see, the consequence of those who are able to sympathize and show compassion to other sinners just like them and who are purely motivated in their allegiance to Christ and how they conduct themselves is that they will seek to make peace with God and also make peace with others between themselves and between their fellow men. Peace is the central idea of this beatitude. And peace is the central theme throughout all of Scripture, both the Old and the New Testaments. The Greek word for peace is irene. It is where we get the English adjective irenic, and it describes of moving one to a peaceful state. So the irenic uh, 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 countryside where it's just peaceful and it just, ah, I just, I love, I'm content. But in Hebrew, the word for peace is shalom. Say it with me, shalom. I didn't hear you. Say it again. Shalom. Good. Shalom is a word that carries a tremendous amount of meaning. Shalom does not just mean the absence of trouble. In Israel, the way that people greet one another is by saying, Shalom, Shalom. But it's done in a way that's kind of like our, how's it going? Or what's up? And biblically speaking, Shalom is more than just a greeting or wishing someone well. Shalom, from the perspective of the Bible, always means everything that makes for a person's highest good. Shalom from the biblical context is not just peace from trouble, but the enjoyment of all that is good. And the highest good of any person is to be called a child of God. There is nothing better in all of life than to be a son and daughter of the living God. Nothing at all. Not all the riches, not all the wealth, not all the material possessions, not all the recognition or notoriety. Nothing is greater than being called a child of God. And so someone who is a member of the kingdom of heaven must function at that level of understanding of peace, for we are called to be peacemakers. We are called to make shalom not just possible, but a reality in the lives of those around us, because this is exactly what Jesus has modeled for us by becoming one of us. In Scripture, Jesus is named the Prince of Peace. Jesus has exemplified for us making shalom a reality through his life, death, and resurrection. It is through the shed blood of Christ that our sin, your sin, and my sin, that condition of our soul that separates us from being able to have a relationship with God is forgiven by God. And we're not just forgiven of our sin, 
It doesn't just stop there. No, we're, we're not only forgiven, but we are washed clean and we're purified of our sin. And our sinful nature is replaced with a brand new nature. We're no longer enemies of God, but sons and daughters of God. Why? Because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has made peace between our sinful self and a holy God, the ultimate shalom. Through Jesus Christ, we can now have the relationship with God that we were created and called to live. And just as Jesus has made peace between God and man, we are called to make peace between each other. Christian author Ken Sandy, who who founded Peacemaker Ministries, states in his book, The Peacemaker, he says this, he says, peacemakers are people who breathe grace. They draw continually on the goodness and power of Jesus Christ. And then they bring his love, mercy, forgiveness, strength, and wisdom to the conflicts of daily life. God delights to breathe his grace through peacemakers and use them to dissipate anger, to improve understanding, promote justice, and encourage repentance and reconciliation. I think that's a pretty amazing picture of what a peacemaker is and who a peacemaker is. And that is exactly how we're called to act in relationship with other people, regardless of who they are. Notice that being a peacemaker is not conditioned in any way as though we only make peace with those who think like us or vote like us or worship like us. Not at all. Being a peacemaker does not entail that we just allow people to do what they want either, when they want or how they want, regardless of how their choices affect others. Not at all. That would be uh, an example of extreme tolerance. And while there is an element of tolerance in peacemaking, ultimately our goal is to point them to Christ so that they are transformed spiritually through salvation, to embrace the love that God has for them, and then to see that transforming shalom permeate throughout all areas of their lives. Another way to think through this beatitude is, oh, the blessedness of the person who produces right relationships by representing the shalom of God between man and man, for they prove their adoption as the children of God. Now, Jesus recognized that the fact that not everyone that we encounter is going to welcome our desire to bring God's shalom into their lives. There will be those who reject God's peace. And we can fully expect rejection and persecution, which leads us to the last beatitude and its fuller explanation. Blessed are those, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus then expounds on this persecution when he says this. He says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Persecution is an experience that we are all going to have as we follow Christ. And especially those who labor in making peace. Those, they're the ones that are going to experience the fiercest persecution. It's an unfortunate reality that not all of our attempts at reconciliation, even in spite of our best attempts and, and the purest of our motives that would give all glory to God, result in reconciliation. That's due to the fact that there exists in the world people who, who make it their mission in life to oppose those of us who would seek to make peace between God and His creation, not for any other reason, but for righteousness' sake. And on the account of us following Jesus Christ. Now, the persecution that the early Christians faced is something that we can barely imagine. Men and women gladly giving their lives for the sake of the name of Jesus, to be counted worthy to suffer physical torture and martyrdom on account of their refusal to renounce Christ and declare that Caesar was Lord. If you haven't read it, I would highly suggest that you read through Fox's Book of Martyrs to, to really get a grasp and an understanding of the suffering that our Christian forebears endured for their faith. But Jesus doesn't leave his hearers with just a general beatitude of persecution for the sake of righteousness. He gets much more specific. In fact, if you notice in that, that verses 11 and 12, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you falsely on my account, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Notice how Jesus has changed the pronoun from the third person, blessed are those, to the second person, blessed are you. 
Jesus is saying to his followers, you can expect persecution and reviling and false accusations for no other reason than that you follow me. Not me, but Jesus. Jesus gets specific about the kinds of persecution that those who follow him will face, reviling and false accusations. But by virtue of our righteous way of living, persecution can be expected and it is almost a guarantee. Jesus was not leaving any doubt in the minds of those who would follow him of what would happen to them. One of, my, one of the most reassuring passages in the New Testament is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. John says this, he says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Doesn't that just fill your heart with courage and hope? It's quite a contrast to find the blessedness in persecution, knowing that the world hates us. So how then should we respond to that reviling and false accusation and any other kind of persecution? Well, Jesus tells us. He says, we're to rejoice and be glad. What? Rejoice and be glad for when I get falsely accused for no other reason than I'm a Christian and a follower of Christ? I mean, I live in America, and America was founded on Christian principles. What about my freedom in the First Amendment? What country are we leaving in anyway? Oh, wait. Jesus doesn't say any of that, does he? It's because our identity as members of the kingdom of heaven transcends and overrides our citizenship in this great country where we currently live. And that, my friends, is something that can be very difficult for us to differentiate. Jesus is describing the house rules for being a part of his family. So what kind of persecution is Jesus really talking about here? Like, does not being able to gather together in the same physical space for worship constitute persecution? Some would say yes. Others would say no. For me, I I don't think so, really. Because in the current midst of our pandemic and our sheltering place, churches are not being singled out and excluded from gathering together. Concerts, sporting events, classrooms in schools and universities, elective surgeries, all other kinds of gatherings are all being excluded from gathering. So it's not that churches are being singled out. So we are not facing any kind of persecution. But ask me if my opinion would change it after the shelter in place order is lifted and there's no restrictions for gathering except together as churches. I might have a different response for you then. But let's get back to Jesus's point. When we face genuine persecution and rejection, we are to rejoice and be glad. That should be our response because our reward is waiting for us in heaven. Famous theologian and Bible commentator John Stott describes how we shouldn't respond when faced with persecution. He writes this, he says, we are not to retaliate like an unbeliever, nor to sulk like a child, nor to lick our wounds in self-pity like a dog, nor just to grin and bear it like a stoic, and still less to pretend like we enjoy it like a masochist. What then? We are to rejoice as a Christian should rejoice, and even to leap for joy. Why so? Partly because, Jesus added, your reward is great in heaven. We may lose everything on earth, but we shall inherit everything in heaven. Not as a reward for merit, however, because the promise of the reward is free. Now, don't miss this next part. But partly because persecution is a token of genuineness a certificate of Christian authenticity for so men persecuted the prophets who went before you. When we suffer persecution for righteousness sake, it is a validation of our Christian witness and our testimony. And so more important than even being counted as one among the prophets, the main reason that we should rejoice, according to Stott, is that we are suffering on quote-unquote my account. The account of Jesus himself and our loyalty loyalty to him and to his standard of truth and righteousness. Suffering persecution and rejection for the sake of Christ was something the apostles knew and embraced. If you want, check out Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17 and following. Towards the end of that chapter, in verse 40 and 41, you'll notice this. The apostles were uh, imprisoned and they were... um, beaten and thrown out of jail in verse 40. <clears throat> and and the, uh, the Gamaliel, the, the, uh, the prophet, was, they were having a, a conference among the, the, uh, the Pharisees on what to do with this uprising. 
And he said, well, if it's of God, it's, there's nothing we can do to stop it. But if it's of men, then we have nothing to worry about. So they, they took his advice. And verse 40, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And this is what's so amazing in verse 41. Then they, the, the apostles, they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor. They were beaten and they were happy about it. What kind of crazy is that? It's a crazy that has pledged loyalty and allegiance to the risen Savior. So another way of thinking of this is that when a person has to suffer something for their faith, that is the way to the closest possible companionship with Jesus. Now for us in this country, it's not likely that death awaits us because of our loyalty to Christ. Sure, we're going to experience ridicule and mockery as we show Christian love and forgiveness. We, we who follow Christ might also experience persecution through maybe the loss of financial opportunity or gain through our business because we might refuse to work or receive contracts for groups that contradict the clear teaching of Christ. However, in other parts of the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are losing their lives because of their loyalty and allegiance to Jesus. We need to remember and pray for those faithful who meet underground and whose worship of Christ risks their lives and the lives of those they love. You know, it's one thing for me to, to lay down my life. It's another thing for me to worship Jesus when the life of my wife or my kids are being threatened or as they're being tortured in front of me. But by the grace of God, we are to respond and rejoice because it's blessed. We are blessed when we are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And as we navigate this difficult, demand, this difficult demand to be willing to face persecution and the reviling from those outside of the kingdom of God, we must keep in mind that Christ still needs his witnesses. He needs those of us who have counted the cost to be prepared, not so much to die for him as to live for him. And as we finish out the Beatitudes this morning, I am filled with hope and expectation. Now, as a parent, my greatest desire is that my kids choose to follow Jesus. That's my goal. That's my focus, my main priority. But in order for that goal to be even possible, my wife and I have to develop a plan to get there. And part of that plan involves establishing the rules of our home and how life in our home will function. Sure, I want my kids to be well-behaved and well thought of, but just following the rules isn't the main thing. But those house rules are essential to the character and training of our children to become like Jesus and to prepare them for a lifetime of following Jesus. Now, I realize that these rules and this goal that my wife and I have for our kids doesn't guarantee that they will follow Jesus. That is a decision that they have to make for themselves and on their own so that their faith is their own and not mine. But it does move us in the right direction. And in a similar way, and actually in a more profoundly perfect way than what I want for my kids. God wants you and I to become like Jesus. That's his goal for our lives. And he has a plan to get us there. And an essential part of that plan includes the foundation of his house rules or the Beatitudes. These house rules form the baseline of how we are to live as members of the kingdom of heaven. Now, through the time that we've spent looking through and considering the Beatitudes, we, we now have a firmer grasp on our relationship with God of who we are in Him and how our relationship with God impacts how we relate to others. And as we look forward to studying the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to learn from Jesus on how to apply these house rules to every area of our life that we will encounter and how we're to build our lives according to Jesus' blueprints for life. I'm so excited that we get to be on this journey together. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the beauty and the truth of your word. We thank you that your word is living and active and it's, it's capable of piercing us to the very marrow of our soul, dividing us, Lord, so that we know what's right and what's not right. Help us, Lord, to, to 
uh, lean into you and, and, to, and to learn from you. And Holy Spirit, uh, drive home this tr- the truth of who we are in, in you and, and who we are to be in our relationship with others. As we, as we seek to make peace, as we, we seek to be uh, pure in our hearts, Lord, as we, as we seek to uh, show mercy, for we too then will receive mercy. And God, when we face persecution, when we face reviling and and false accusations, God, may we respond with joy, knowing that our reward is in heaven and knowing that men and women, the prophets of old, have gone before and that they too endured persecution at the hands of sinners. And Lord, nobody greater than you yourself endured death on the cross at the hands of sinners, Lord. So God, may we follow your example and may we draw close to you um, I pray for those that are suffering right now. Lord, I pray that the body of Christ at Faith Bridge would, would rise up and rally around and, and show mercy to the hurting in our community. Lord, I, I think of Ron James, and I just pray for your blessing of healing upon him and, and your encouragement of, of his wife, Corey, and Nikki, Lord, and, and uh, Grandma LeMay, Lord, that you just bring blessing and healing and peace into their lives. The shalom of God. Lord, we thank you for this time. And I I can't wait for us to be able to gather together again in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Now, after our next song, we're going to be led in communion. And I can't wait for our guest to lead us. So I would encourage you to get the elements ready at home if you haven't already done so. And with that, let's continue in worshiping our great God together. I invite you to continue worshiping with us this morning.
Speaking of Pastor Jeff's reference to Matthew 5, 9 this morning, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We're remembering the greatest peacemaker, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him and him alone, we have peace with God. And further, the Apostle Paul states in Colossians 1.20 that God has made peace through the blood of his cross. God has made peace through the blood of his cross. We all want peace and peaceful lives, families, communities, and in our nation and world. But the most important peace is peace with God, our maker and judge. Peace on earth is very short-sighted if we are not at peace with our Heavenly Father. We want to make sure of our eternal peace and rest. And the Lord Jesus has graciously made that possible by giving his body and shedding his blood on the cross. Through the cross and the cross alone is the promise of peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. At the table, we remember the cross this morning in obedience to Christ's command to do this in remembrance of him. We receive the bread, which reminds us of his broken body that bore our sins, and the cup as a reminder of Jesus' lifeblood that was shed, cleansing us from sin. Just take a few moments and allow these truths to sink in and be renewed in our minds of the great price that was paid for our peace with God. Let's pause a few minutes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your gracious gift of the Lord Christ. Thank you that you so loved the world that you gave. And thank you that we have, you have put it in our hearts to receive that gift. And we thank you for the peace that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for these elements that we share together this morning, for the, the, death, the death of Christ that cleanses us from sin and guarantees forgiveness and life eternal. We are blessed and we thank you. Amen. Amen. As the bread and the cup have been prepared, you may partake of them as you feel prepared and are ready to do that. Our Father, again, we thank you for the grace that's been extended to us through the Lord Jesus and his wonderful mercy that we didn't at all deserve. And so we sit, we stand humbly before you, accepting your great love and your love gift of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the hope of life eternal through him. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to worship with us as we close the service out with the doxology. Let's sing this song as a prayer of praise to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here.
thanks for worshiping with us this morning. It was so great to be with you. And um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is after the service, after the live stream, there are going to be some questions uh, for you to discuss uh, amongst your those who are watching with you uh, as a way to maybe uh, dive a little bit deeper into the message. And if you're not going to do that right after the service, feel free to use it with your small group at some point this week. Thanks again. Have a great week. And remember, as you go about your week, that we are the church, that we love God, and we love others. We'll see you next time.